This evening I'd like to uh, introduce what we're looking at by reading another passage of Scripture that reminds us where forgiveness is, and that would be in 1 John chapter 1. And I'd like to read, um, I believe I, I gave as my reading, the, the ten verses of the first chapter of John's letter. By the way, I would recommend uh, the reading of 1 John if you haven't read it uh, recently or if you've never read it. It, it was written uh, to show us whether or not we actually are savingly trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting that the theme of the letter isn't found at the opening of the letter, but rather at the end where John says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, it's not enough to just think you're believing, but believing you need to see certain things at work in your life. And John points those things out very clearly. One of them is that we will be confessing our sins as we walk in the light with the Lord. Let me uh, read for you First John, the first chapter, verses 1 through 10. What was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. A couple of things just to note here at the outset is that um, John was writing to combat a very uh, a particular error that uh, had risen at that time, and in the, it was even affecting the church, of course, and that was an earlier form of Gnosticism, uh, the idea that um, everything material is evil. Um, of course, philosophers went two different ways with that. Since uh, everything material is evil, doesn't matter what I do with material things or with my body. Others were saying we need to deny everything that has to do with the body. Uh, so you had the Stoics and the Epicureans and so forth, some who indulge and some who abstain. But the problem was that those who embraced this idea began to deny that Jesus Christ could have actually become a man because being material, he would be evil. Uh, so they would deny that. But you'll notice the emphasis that John writes at the very beginning here where he says, we have heard him, we've seen him, we've handled him, we've touched him. Why, why are they even bringing that up? I mean, why would, why would it matter whether they touched Jesus or not? It's because we touched him and we've seen that he isn't just a phantom walking around, a spirit that looks like a man. He has substance. He is a man. Uh, he, you have to believe that. You have to believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Apart from his taking our nature, we could not be saved. And so he's dealing with that particular error. But he also points out that that, that error, as well as all error, could condemn you, of course, if it strikes at the heart of the gospel, which that particular error does. That we have to be walking in the light and not in the darkness. Now, light and darkness in Scripture can mean a couple of things. It, it refers to truth versus error, and it refers to godliness versus sin. And I think in this case, it refers to both, that we need to believe the truth in order to walk with God. We need to be practicing the truth in order to walk with Him. And if we say we walk with Him, but we don't believe the truth and we're not walking in the truth, 
then we're essentially liars and we do not have the forgiveness of our sins. But if we are walking in the truth as he is in the truth, as he is in the light, then the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. If that is true, we'll also be confessing our sins. And as we are continually confessing them, the Lord is continually cleansing us of our sins. And by that, I don't think the Lord is, is telling us here, or that John's telling us, that forgiveness is dependent upon whether or not we confess those particular sins. But he's saying that if you are a believer, if you're walking in the light, believing the truth, walking with God, that is what you're going to be doing. When you sin, you'll confess your sins. You'll repent of your sins. And the Lord will continually be cleansing you of your sins. But the point we want to see this evening is simply this. This is a transaction that takes place between you and the Lord. You're walking with the Lord. You're confessing your sins to him. And he is forgiving you. There is no earthly priest involved in this process, which is what we're going to be looking at uh, this evening. Now, you know that up to this point, we've considered how it is that Rome deals with, um, uh, well, sin. Uh, they first of all divide it into two categories. Uh, when you sin, you become guilty. When you sin, there is punishment due to that sin. They divide that punishment really into two kinds. There's eternal punishment, which comes about from the guilt. And there's temporal punishment that comes about from injuries perhaps you've committed against God and others uh, that have to do with this, with this life. Now, the way they deal with the temporal punishment is through indulgences and through purgatory. Uh, if you don't um, uh, make, uh, do enough to satisfy for your sins on earth, for your good works, your prayers, your alms, and, and various other things, buying indulgences, receiving indulgences from others who purchase them for you, then when you die, you have to go to purgatory where you're purged of your sins and imperfections and you, you finish making satisfaction for temporal punishment before you can enter into heaven. Now, we've already seen that the Bible says nothing about indulgences. The Bible says nothing about purgatory. The Bible says rather that if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will go directly to heaven when you die because the Lord Jesus has made full satisfaction for your temporal punishments in his sufferings. And then again, Rome has a way of dealing with, with the uh, eternal punishment, with the guilt that would send you to hell. They believe that uh, you need to be baptized. They believe that when you are baptized, that Adam's sin, which was credited to you because he represented you in the garden, is forgiven. They believe that when you're baptized that the sins you have committed in this world are forgiven. By the way, we saw that Lutherans believe essentially the same thing, that the Lord uses baptism to forgive you of your sins. Now, they believe that God works through baptism in, in a similar way that he works through the word of God, that baptism saves you because God promises to save you through baptism, which is interesting. We saw that that, as a matter of fact, isn't how the Lord works. Uh, we saw rather that baptism is uh, a symbol of the forgiveness that the Lord grants to us through spiritual baptism, which is that act of the Holy Spirit placing us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And once we are in him, all that Jesus has done becomes ours. Our sins are removed and his righteousness is given to us and we are saved. Baptism doesn't save us. God doesn't work through water baptism to save us, but rather water baptism is, is a symbol of what the Spirit of God does in our souls when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So basically what we're saying is this, that, that satisfaction for our sins and forgiveness for our sins does not come through an institution. It doesn't come through... The church, in the way that Rome believes that it does, you don't need an earthly priest to minister indulgences, to open the treasury of heaven, to dole out those excess merits of the saints or of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need a priest to um, really to, to baptize you. And we're also going to see this evening that you don't need a priest to minister penance to you or to absolve you of your sins. The church is not here to fill that particular role. 
Uh, we don't forgive sins. We don't dole out salvation. The church is here rather to point to the one who, who does, who has the ability to do these things, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, I think a very um, vivid picture of, of what the church does, even though it's represented by a, perhaps a, a, a gospel minister, does apply to the church as a whole, uh, to, uh, well, I think, um, according to the, the commission, but it's, it's given to us in Pilgrim's Progress. I think it's in stark contrast to what we see Rome saying up to this point. If you recall, when, when Pilgrim went through the wicked gate, the very first house he came to was Interpreter's house. An interpreter showed him uh, several different uh, rooms, and in each room was a spiritual lesson. And I think it was the first room that he saw the portrait of the, uh, the godly minister, again, which I think is a picture of the work of the church and not just the work of the minister. All of us are to do this. But look at this in contrast to what Rome is saying with regard to the priesthood. Uh, Bunyan writes this, Now interpreter led the pilgrim into a private room, and there he ordered his man to open a door. Then did Christian see the picture of a very grave person hanging against the wall. And its features were as <clears throat> follows. This man had his eyes directed up toward heaven, the best of books in his hand. The law of truth was written upon his lips. The world was behind his back. He stood as if he pleaded with men, and a crown of gold hung over his head. Now, we could get into all the features of this image, but let me just point out this. Um, in this picture, we don't see uh, a man with his face toward purgatory with indulgences in one hand and the waters of baptism in the other hand, standing as if he wanted and was waiting to hear your confession. You know, this is an entirely different picture of one who is facing heaven, his eyes toward heaven. There's no purgatory to look towards. With the Bible as his guide, in other words, the gospel, armed with the gospel, uh, the law of God on his lips, really the gospel on his lips, pleading with men to forsake the world, and to seek heaven through Jesus Christ. Now that really is a summary of what the Lord gives us to do in the Great Commission. Because the Lord alone can forgive us. The Lord alone can save us. The work of the church is to point to Jesus Christ. It's not to stand between Jesus and the sinner and dole out salvation or forgiveness on his behalf. Now, baptism for Rome, we saw, was the, the first part of what they call the exercise of the keys of the kingdom of God, what they call the first plank of justification. They, they use the image of a ship, and basically we've shipwrecked our faith, and we need to rebuild our salvation, as it were. The first plank that recovers man is baptism. Basically, when you're baptized, it's the exercise of the keys the doors of the kingdom of heaven are open to you because all your guilt is forgiven, as well as any satisfaction that you may owe for your sins. But there is a second plank that is also necessary to get to heaven, the second plank of justification, uh, according to Rome, because you don't stop sinning after you've been baptized. Most people will not be baptized at the very end of their lives. Rather, they'll be baptized toward the beginning. So the Lord has to have, well, he has to have a way of dealing with sins that take place after baptism through the church. And for Rome, that way is penance. Uh, again, we read from the Catholic Catechism, uh, this particular, these particular quotes. If the church has the power to forgive sins, which they believe it does, then baptism cannot be her only means of using the keys of the kingdom of heaven received from Jesus Christ. The church must be able to forgive all penitents their offenses, even if they should sin until the last moment of their lives. It is through the sacrament of penance that the baptized can be reconciled with God and with the church. This sacrament of penance is necessary for salvation for those who have fallen after baptism just as baptism is necessary for salvation for those who have not yet been reborn. Now again, I, I, you know, I don't think you'll find any clearer statements than this. 
You need baptism to be reborn. We saw that last time. The new birth for them comes through baptism. But how do you deal with sins after baptism? It's through the sacrament of penance. Uh, the way that we can be reconciled with God, the way that we can be recovered if we lose our salvation is only through penance. So this evening what I'd like to do is consider, first of all, what penance is and why Rome, of course, believes that we need it. And then secondly, to emphasize again what the Bible says we need in order to be forgiven. And let's not forget the purpose. This is why the Reformation took place. And let's not forget this is still very applicable to today. We need to make sure that we're not going the direction of Rome and we need to make sure that we're equipped to help those who are actually find salvation because you're not going to find it in places where it isn't. You're only going to find it where the Lord has put it. That's in Jesus Christ. So first of all, what is penance? And again, I want to um, uh, go through questions and answers from the catechism, the Catholic catechism, so that we get a bigger picture of it. Uh, basically, answering the question, what is penance? Penance is the sacrament of forgiveness. This is what they say. The forgiveness of sins committed after baptism is conferred by a particular sacrament called the sacrament of conversion, confession, penance, or reconciliation. Called by different names, but penance. Now what happens when you sin? The sinner wounds God's honor and love. His own human dignity as a man called to be a son of God. And the spiritual well-being of the church of which each Christian ought to be a living stone. By the way, I should just pause here for a minute and say this. We don't disagree with everything that Rome says here. But we're going to look at what we agree with and what we disagree with. Okay, so I think we agree with what they just said here. Now, what are the consequences of sin? Well, they believe the sin is serious enough, if it's a mortal sin, that it kills grace in you and you actually lose your salvation and are in danger of damnation. This is what they say. To the eyes of faith, no evil is greater than sin, and nothing has worse consequences for sinners themselves, for the church, and for the whole world. They don't actually spell out what those are, but we'll see it implied in, in what follows. Now, having lost, you see, that grace by which you're saved through mortal sin, having killed that sin in you or that grace in you, how can you regain that grace? How can you rega regain salvation? Communion with God if you can only be baptized once. Well, to return with, to communion with God after having lost it through sin is a process born of the grace of God who is rich in mercy and solicitous for the salvation of men. One must ask for this precious gift for oneself and for others. Okay, how do you do that? What is the first step in this process? The movement of return to God called conversion and repentance entails sorrow for and abhorrence of sins committed and the firm purpose of sinning no more in the future. Conversion touches the past and the future and is nourished by hope in God's mercy. But that's not all. What else is involved? The sacrament of penance is a whole consisting in three actions of the penitent and the priest's absolution. The penitent's acts are repentance, confession or disclosure of sins to the priest, and the intention to make reparation and do works of reparation. Okay, what is the motive behind repentance? Repentance, also called contrition, must be inspired by motives that arise from faith. If repentance arises from love of charity for God, it is called perfect contrition. If it is founded on other motives, it is called imperfect. Now, it doesn't go into this, but I think you need perfect if you're going to be forgiven. Now, what does confession involve? One who desires to obtain reconciliation with God and with the church must confess to a priest all the unconfessed grave sins he remembers after having carefully examined his conscience. The confession of venial faults without being necessary in itself is nevertheless strongly recommended 
by the church. You need to confess your mortal sins. The venial sins are optional, though they recommend that you, you do that. Now, what about reparation? What's involved in that? The confessor proposes the performance of certain acts of satisfaction or penance to be performed by the penitent in order to repair the harm caused by sin and to reestablish habits befitting a disciple of Christ. Now, who can do this? I mean, who can be the confessor? Who can forgive the penitent? Who can uh, give him the work to do? Only priests who have received the faculty of absolving from the authority of the church can forgive sins in the name of Christ. Only priests can forgive. Now, what can you expect from penance? And here are the results. The spiritual effects of the sacrament of penance are reconciliation with God, by which the penitent recovers grace. You get that grace back. Reconciliation with the church. Your sin puts you at odds with the church. Now you're reconciled with the church. Remission or forgiveness of the eternal punishment incurred by mortal sins. In other words, your guilt is forgiven. Remission, at least in part, of temporal punishments resulting from sin. Not full remission, just partial. Peace and serenity of conscience and spiritual consolation and an increase of spiritual strength for the Christian battle. By the way, uh, you'll notice again that Rome is tying forgiveness to the church. Uh, Rome is still not letting you off the hook. There's still temporal punishments you need to deal with. And so buy some indulgences, light a candle, you know, pay, pay to light the candle. I think I, I told you that um, when we were in um, uh, St. Paul, we went to St. Paul's Cathedral and there were dispensers of grace in, in all the different areas. You could light candles to many different saints. There was holy water available for use, um, either coming in or even to take home, holy water for home use. Uh, I think um, <laughs> if you've looked at uh, Sarah's uh, Facebook, uh, I think uh, the profile picture, she used that one at least for a while of uh, drinking out of the, uh, the holy water spigot, although she was just kidding. <laughs> But the thing is, there, there is grace, and the grace comes through the church. It's tied to the church, and the idea is you need to deal with, with these um, temporal punishments. You need to make satisfaction uh, before you can uh, be free of it. And, and most believers won't. They'll, they'll have to spend perhaps millions of years in purgatory, according to Rome, before those things are satisfied. But in conclusion... They say this, individual and integral confession of grave sins followed by absolution or the forgiveness of the priest remains the only ordinary means of reconciliation with God and with the church. And again, since temporal punishments aren't fully satisfied, what do you have to do to deal with them? They remind you again through indulgences, the faithful can obtain the remission of temporal punishment resulting from sin for themselves and also for the souls in purgatory. By the way, you, you have you know, not only your own satisfaction to deal with, but you can help those that are in purgatory by buying indulgences. As you buy them, uh, it lessens their time in purgatory. Now, really, you have no way of knowing how long they're going to be there, so I guess uh, you don't really know how much of indulgence you need. But I would, again, uh, just remind you of what Martin Luther had to say about the whole idea. If the church has the authority to open a treasury that is in heaven and to pour out as much as they want, why don't they just do it out purely out of love? Open up that treasury and release those poor souls from purgatory. Why make people pay for it? Of course, their answer was they didn't want it to be too easy because then you, know, you wouldn't take it seriously. Well, anyway, to summarize uh, what we've seen to this point, Jesus gave authority to his apostles, the keys of the kingdom, the power to forgive sins in, in their view. Sins in their view are forgiven through baptism, and since it can only be done once, the other sacrament by which sins committed after baptism can be forgiven is penance. When you do commit serious sins after baptism, mortal sins, you destroy the grace of God in you, and so you are alienated from God in danger of damnation. To return to God, you need to be sorry for your sin, you need to hate it, you need to turn from it, 
purpose to sin no more. You need to confess your sin to a priest, especially those mortal sins. The priest will give you works to perform to repair the harm that you've done and reestablish your life in the path of righteousness. And if you agree to do it, he will absolve you. He will forgive you of your sins in the name of Christ. And when this is all said and done, you will be reconciled with God, with the church. Your sins will be forgiven. Some of your temporal punishment removed, but not all of it. You will have peace of conscience, and you will be stronger to be able to continue the Christian warfare. Now, I hope you get a good idea of what Rome is teaching. Let's move on now to what the Bible actually says about forgiveness. And we do believe that what the Bible says is different, as we've already seen. Now, we've already looked at the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And we believe that what Jesus meant by giving these keys to his uh, apostles and from there to the ministers is basically not to forgive sins, because who can forgive sins but God alone? But rather to declare on the basis of the word of God, when a person repents and trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, that their sins have been forgiven by God. You know, the, the, the ministers, even the apostles, never forgave sins. They never said what Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven you. But rather they allowed people to come into the church or they put people out of the church on the basis of whether they were repenting and believing. That is the exercise of the keys. It's not to forgive sins, but rather to declare whether or not they're forgiven. We've already seen that you don't need baptism to be forgiven. Though, of course, we also saw that if you have trusted in Jesus and turned from your sins, that you will receive baptism because that's what the Lord commands. But you don't need to be baptized to be saved. The thief on the cross is the perfect example of that. And the fact that we saw last week that the Apostle Paul said, Jesus didn't send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the gospel. And I thank God I didn't baptize any of you except for these few individuals here so that you would not say, you are baptized in my name. Because who is Paul, right? But how can that be reconciled with the idea that you need to be baptized to be saved? It, it isn't. Jesus would have sent him specifically to baptize if it were tied to baptism. Now, again, we agree and we disagree with different elements of what we've seen in Rome, but let's see where those agreements and disagreements are. We agree that there is forgiveness and that God is merciful, and he has made every provision for us to arrive in heaven. But that provision is in Jesus Christ, and we receive it by faith. Uh, we agree that sin injures God's honor and his love. It, it, it hurts him, it offends him, and it injures the church of which we're a part. It affects the testimony of the church. We agree with Rome on that. We agree with Rome that sin is serious, very serious. There is no greater evil in the world than sin. You know, the Puritans were actually quite, um, quite good at, at bringing these things out by, will, by way of illustration. And one Puritan, I, I forget exactly who it was, once wrote this, that he would rather be cast body and soul into hell than to commit one sin. And we might be, be shocked by that statement, but what he meant was, is this, there's no sin in suffering in hell. It's punishment for sin. But there's no sin in being in hell, as it were, if you were to cast yourself in. But sin itself is a moral evil that is infinitely offensive to God. And so he, they, they said that they would rather do that than to offend God, to sin against his love, to sin against his justice. Now, we would also agree with Rome that some, well, actually, we would disagree here. Rome makes a difference between mortal and venial sins. And what they mean is there are some sins that kill the grace of God in you and actually turn you into a non-Christian, uh, make you in danger of hell. Venial sins are lesser sins that, that don't do that. They, they wound the conscience. They, they're offensive to God, but they don't kill grace. We disagree with that. The Bible actually teaches that all sins are mortal sins. All sins kill. Everybody who, who is in this world that is guilty of even one sin is dead because of that sin. And even if they only had one sin to deal with, that one sin would be enough to press them down 
into hell forever because it is an infinite offense against God. Even the smallest sin can kill your soul. And it would certainly do that to each one of us if we were outside of Christ. But we believe also that the greatest sin cannot kill the grace of God in your soul if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Basically, no matter what you do, the Lord will never cast you out of his family. He will never disown you, but he will hold on to you. I mean, think about Peter who denied the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about David who had a man murdered. He was guilty of murder. And, he, and that was to cover over his sin of adultery with Bathsheba. Uh, Christians could commit serious sins, but God doesn't cast us away. He will discipline us for those things. And he'll do what's necessary to get us to repent, but he never will disown us. Jesus said regarding his sheep in John 10, verse 28, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. When the Lord purposes to save, he saves eternally. No one of his children will ever be lost which means that even though the sins we commit, if we are outside of Christ, would destroy us in Jesus Christ, they can never destroy us because of his mercy and grace. He is continually cleansing us of all sins. Now, on the other hand, we agree with Rome that even though that is true, we still need to deal with our sins. You know, we may not be cast out of God's family. We may not lose our sonship or our adoption, but we do lose something of our fellowship with him, uh, what we would call his comfortable presence. I mean, have you ever noticed that if you sin, you, you feel somewhat estranged and alienated from God, and you have to deal with those sins before you feel, again, close to him? Uh, again, we call that his comfortable presence. It doesn't mean you haven't been or that you've been you know, thrown out of his family and you need to be adopted and brought in again. Uh, we believe that, it, well, it alienates us, but not fully. When that happens, what do you do? What, what does the Lord tell us to do? Well, something similar to Rome, but not exactly like Rome. You do need to repent. You do need to confess your sins. And you do need to make restitution if restitution is called for because of the particular sins you've committed. Now, with regard to repentance, we agree with Rome again. You do need to be sorry that you've sinned. You need to hate your sin. And you need to hate it primarily because it is offensive to the one whom you love. And it's not just because you got caught and now you're in trouble. And you do need to turn from that sin and you need to purpose in your heart not to return to it, but to do what is right. We agree with Rome. We also agree with Rome that you need to confess your sins, but we disagree to whom you confess your sins. We don't confess our sins to an earthly priest but we confess them to our heavenly high priest. We do read in our text, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And there is no mention of confessing these sins to an earthly priest. We confess them to the Lord. And how do we know that? Well, David writes more clearly in Psalm 32 in our call to worship. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. Sounds to me like he was estranged from God. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. And my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Not to a priest. And you forgave the guilt of of my sin. Was this only for David? Was this like the, the privilege of kings to go directly to the Lord and not to the priest? No, he says, therefore let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. You don't go to an earthly priest to confess your sins. You confess them to the Lord and he forgives you if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, do we have to make reparation for our sins, which is the third part? Remember, we got repentance, confession, reparation. Well, we don't 
necessarily believe in the way that they believe, but we do believe that in some cases you do have to make restitution, which is a form of reparation. If you steal something, if you're going to be forgiven, you do need to give it back. I mean, if you're repentant, you'll give it back, right? If you've slandered someone or you've injured someone's reputation with some kind of a lie, you need to go to the person that you slandered that person to and ask for their forgiveness as well as the one that you've slandered. You need to go to them too. You need to try to undo the damage that, that you can do. You don't just walk away and, and leave them bruised and wounded or leave them with that loss. Uh, you need to do what you can to undo that damage. There was, a, I think, a great example of this that is uh, perhaps an extreme one, but one that I think was right. Uh, in uh, Neil's History of the Puritans, he, he writes about a particular man who was a Puritan. I don't know if he was a minister or simply one who uh, believed in uh, the Puritan interpretation of Scripture, which is essentially the soundest that there is. But he was one day hunting game. And there was a rustling in the bush, thinking that it was an animal that he might uh, bring home for a meal. He shot into the bush, and when he went to reclaim his trophy, he found that he'd actually killed a man instead of an animal, somebody else who was out there hunting. It seems very foolish to be rustling in a bush if there's other people that are hunting around you. But this man sought out the family of the man that he had accidentally killed, and since the man had a wife and children who had no means now of support, he provided for them for the rest of their lives because he took away their provision. He made restitution for what he had taken from them. Now, of course, other things could have happened. The woman could have remarried. Perhaps she could find a new uh, suitable uh, person. But because he had killed the husband, he, he believed that his restitution as a part of his repentance, even though it was done accidentally, he still was the one who took away that means of support and so he provided for them. Now again, restitution isn't always necessary. Sometimes our sins are directed against the Lord and all the restitution we need for that has really been paid by the Lord Jesus Christ. If it doesn't injure somebody else, but if it does, I think you understand the Old Testament especially gives us very clear um, directions on making restitution to, to pay back uh, what we've stolen to uh, repair the damage that we've done. But we do need to remember this. Restitution is not the grounds of your forgiveness. In other words, you may never make restitution. And it would be wrong not to make restitution, but if you've repented of your sins, and for some reason you're prevented from doing this, uh, you'll still be forgiven. You don't have to do this to get that. You know, it's kind of like what our Lord Jesus Christ says in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, he says, well, he tells us to pray, Lord, forgive us our debts or our sins in the same way that we've forgiven others. And at the end of that um, prayer, he, he basically says this, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive yours. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. Now, we might be tempted to think that forgiveness is based upon our forgiving others, that, that somehow we merit forgiveness by extending forgiveness, but that's not what the Lord means. It can't be, because then salvation would not be by grace through faith alone. What he means, rather, I think, is the same thing with regard to confession. If we are continually confessing our sins, he's continually forgiving us. If we uh, do try to undo the damage we've done in our repentance, the Lord will forgive us. Uh, basically, it's not the grounds of our forgiveness, but rather the evidence that we have been forgiven. I hope you see the point there. If we've trusted in Jesus, we will be confessing our sins. It's the evidence that we're forgiven, that we do this. If we're able to forgive others, it's not the grounds by which God forgives us, but it's the evidence that he has forgiven us because we are willing to forgive other people. So it is the fruit, we might say, of our forgiveness, not the grounds of it. So again, we have those three parts, repentance and confession and restitution. But now what about absolution? Because that's the response of, of the priest. Do we need a priest to forgive us 
Well, no, we, we know that only God can forgive sins. And God does forgive us when we repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we'd certainly agree with Rome that, that when you repent, um, it, you know, it, it helps your, your conscience to hear. Uh, based upon the word of God and based upon your repentance and faith, that, that you are forgiven in, in what we would call the legitimate exercise of the keys of the kingdom. I think it helps, doesn't it? If, especially if you're not fully convinced, am I forgiven or am I not forgiven? What, is, what does God say about forgiveness? Uh, you know, uh, well, I, I go to perhaps somebody who knows, and that person asks certain questions. Well, have you repented of your sins? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Or as... Um, one time, uh, Joe, Dr. Dr. Piper, uh, who's the uh, president of Greenville Seminary, uh, said on one occasion as, as we were receiving somebody into the uh, membership of the church, if, if a session examines you and, and uh, you know, looks at your understanding of the gospel and hears what you had to say about your repentance and your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and how you've been living, and if you're completely honest with the session and the session says, well, based upon the word of God, we believe that your sins are forgiven and we welcome you into the church. I mean, that helps you, you know, especially if, if you don't know as much of what the Word of God says. That can help you. That can certainly help your conscience. That can certainly give you uh, even a, a greater assurance that you really are the Lord's and that your sins are forgiven and that there are no punishments waiting for you after life. But... Rather, there is eternal life in heaven. These things can help. And we also agree with Rome that, that the Lord can actually, through this process of, of repenting and confessing and, and uh, receiving God's forgiveness, can certainly make us stronger and better Christians. Uh, sometimes, as a matter of fact, you can be a better Christian after you've fallen into sin and recovered out of that sin because now you're not perhaps going to be as liable to fall into it again. Uh, sometimes we come out better on the other end because of God's grace and mercy. So yes, it can strengthen us in our spiritual warfare. It doesn't always do that, but oftentimes it does, again, because of the Lord's mercy. And so again, the Bible doesn't tie forgiveness to a church. It doesn't tie forgiveness to an institution but it ties forgiveness to the Lord himself, to the Lord Jesus Christ in him alone is forgiveness of sins and salvation. So if you want forgiveness, this is what you need to do. You need to hate your sins because you've offended the Lord. You need to turn from your sins, purposing never to commit them again, even though we know that oftentimes we do, we still have to turn entirely away from them and purpose in our hearts not to return to them. That is repentance. And you need to trust the Lord Jesus because he is the Savior. You need to look to him alone, to his work alone, to make you right with God. And by the way, you do need to look to him with a willingness to submit to his authority. I mean, repentance means I'm repenting from my rebellion and I'm submitting to the Lord now instead of rebelling against him. So tied up in repentance is the idea of obedience. We can summarize everything by the terms repentance of faith. I turn from my sins to Jesus Christ, I trust in him, and I begin to walk in his ways. If you want forgiveness, that's what you need to do. That's what the message was that the apostles preached. It wasn't go to the priest, but it was go to Jesus Christ, go to him directly. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, which means you will be forgiven. The Lord has entrusted the church with his gospel, as we saw in the portrait of the man who had the book in his hand pleading with the other men to show the world how she might be saved, not to save the world by herself or even with the Lord's help. The church does not grant forgiveness. Only God grants forgiveness, and he does it only through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you believe in him, you will be forgiven. You will be saved. That is the only way. Any other way 
means you will not be forgiven. So trust in Jesus, trust in him alone, and you will receive eternal life. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to, to apply this to us individually.